Hello, my name is Kellen Ness, and we have a Sullivan Farm program here, New Ag in the next stage, with our fifth workshop series. This one is on animal integration and permaculture. So it's about integrating livestock and wildlife with crop cultivation, including forest utilization. So our presenting speakers from my right uh, down is we have Bailey Rose Drown, and she was raised on her family's Holstein Dairy Farm in Michigan. She earned a Bachelor's of Science from Michigan State University's College of Agriculture and Natural Resources and her Master of Science in Sustainable Food Systems from Green Mountain College in 2014. As she was incorporating Upper Pond Farm in Old Lyme. She now feeds her community through a CSA and farmers markets while serving on the Connecticut Farmland Trust Board of Directors. Uh, next, we have Kelly Babin. She's the owner of Howling Flats Farm, a small 12-year-old family farm raising pasture, grass-fed, and finished beef. Pasture-raised, non-GMO-fed pork, lamb, and poultry. Their goal is to make sure that livestock receives the highest quality feed and are well cared for. Then we have Shamu Fenvesi Sade, he co-founder of Adama Farm and Fellowship in Falls Village, Connecticut, almost 20 years ago. Farming to provide great food and for young adults and learn about sustainability, Jewish tradition, and community leadership. Working with goats, chicken, compost, perennials such as berries, chestnuts, and shiitake logs, and infrastructure projects. Shamu also teaches classes on composting, gratitude practices, Judaism, and environmental ethics with a sense of place as well as pickling. And then finally, we have Cynthia Rabinowitz, who is a practicing soil and wetland scientist for 42 years. She is a certified permaculture design consultant and ecological landscape designer. Cynthia was a uh, county agricultural and community resource development agent for Yukon, uh, cooperative extension system from 1980 to 1986 and owned and operated a commercial greenhouse from 1986 to 2001, taught in a graduate programs at Southern Connecticut State University and the University of New Haven, and guest lectured at the Graduate Institute. Cynthia is currently the executive director of the Northwestern Conservation Di District, with uh, a nonprofit organization serving 34 towns with natural resources and land use issues, agriculture, and sustainability. Cynthia can be reached at Cynthia R at nwcd.org. And we'll be starting off our first presentation with Cynthia. bring important information to citizens and farmers in their area. So thank you very much. Of course. My goal in this uh, presentation is to introduce the concept of permaculture and um, hopefully in the short period of time that I have here to um, connect the topic of permaculture to the overall subject of the of the evening which is integrating uh, livestock into other aspects of agriculture in an integrated uh, format so as you can see from the slide that's up now permaculture is a design system and it's a very large complex process which can't really adequately be covered in a 15 minute segment. So I'm going to try to hit on the most important facts about permaculture from my own perspective. And so as I said, it is a design system and as such, it seeks to look at nature and ecology and draw from the knowledge and wisdom that we have learned in the 20th and 21st century about ecology and the way things work in nature and how those systems can be employed 
for human welfare and provide our needs without degrading nature, which unfortunately we've done rather a lot of and we need to uh, regenerate these ecosystems. So just a quick um, intro about the beginnings of permaculture. Um, permaculture came from Australia, where it was founded by um, a university professor named Bill Mollison and his student, David Holmgren, and together they developed the system that they had um, worked on for many years together doing research in the forests of Tasmania. And they have published some um, books which I've listed here on the screen for you as references. They're quite heavy tombs and would take quite a lot of study to get through, but they're infinitely fascinating in my opinion. Um, Bill Mollison brought the concept of permaculture to the United States in, uh, I believe, in the 1970s and early 80s, which is when I first heard about it. And honestly, I'm kicking myself that it really took me until 2008 to delve into permaculture, because once I did, it changed my whole outlook on ecology, um, natural resources, agriculture, and everything basically that I work on in my career. So permaculture again is a design system and it seeks to study the relationships between organisms and their environments. And it's a systemic discipline as opposed to many of the subjects that we study at, in college, various aspects of chemistry or organic chemistry or silviculture, forestry, any number of topics which we learn in single courses um, or multiples of single topic courses that don't seek to integrate to the other disciplines. And that's really the opposite of permaculture because in permaculture we're looking to draw all of these subjects together because really that's the way the, the earth works. So moving on, um, the system of permaculture is based on three ethics. The permaculture ethics are care of the earth. That's number one, and it's tantamount to what permaculture is all about. Um, provision for all life systems to continue and thrive. Then life ethics for people. How do people fit in to all the other life systems on the planet, and how can we have successful access to essential resources for our existence without harming the other eco all the all of the ecosystems that are functioning and then the third ethic is a little bit of a social concept and it's usually referred to as fair share and this is the idea of setting some humane limits to consumption sharing the excess of our productivity with others, including the ecosystems that we draw from and the wildlife that live there. And then we have a set of principles. The permaculture principles are generally considered to be universal, universally applicable guidelines which are used to create sustainable habitats. And again, these are distilled from multiple disciplines, drawing together the, the principles in any permaculture design, in any climate, and at any scale, from the smallest dwelling space to the largest farms. And here is a list of Mollison's own principles, which I'll just read quickly. Permaculture principles focus on thoughtful designs, for small-scale intensive systems which are labor efficient and which use biological resources instead of fossil fuels. Designs stress ecological connections and closed energy and material loops. The core of permaculture is design and the working relationships and connections between all things. So that is something that I've read frequently and have thought about a great deal. I'll just go back for a second 
the relationships and connections between all things. The only way that we can adapt and um, employ these ideas in a farm setting or in any setting really could be a small apartment building or, or a balcony that you want to raise food on. It's possible in urban settings to do that. But tonight we're talking about farm scale and the, the principles are basically the same. And here's a list of permaculture principles, which I'm not going to read. You can scan them um, and you can look them up. We don't have time to delve into all 13 of these permaculture principles here, but they are important as you design your spaces and your farms. I do want to focus on a couple of permaculture techniques, which are part of this list that I'm showing here. Um, these two techniques relate specifically to the topic tonight, which is integrating livestock into um, ag um, agroforestry and silver pasture practices. So two of these permaculture techniques are integrating mammals and poultry into the systems. I suppose if you lived in a part of the world that ate, ate animals from different um, classes of, of an, in the animal kingdom, they would count as well. But I'm thinking mostly of the types of animals that are our livestock here in the northeast of the United States. So integrating the animals into a system that involves trees and um, possibly other perennial crop plants is what I would like to focus on tonight. Um, so let's move on. The fundamental first step in any permaculture application is to do a deep site assessment. Now, if you have ever taken any landscape design courses, you'll have heard that, um, that term about site assessment. But even in landscape design courses, which I have taken, it's not the same approach that we take in permaculture. In permaculture, it's very deep and slow observation. I, I like to refer to it as deeper observation. It requires spending a lot of time on your land, taking the time not to rush into establishing uh, practices or commodities but taking more time to learn how to live on, on your land, reading all of the elements, the water resources, the regional climate, the microclimates, etc. There's a whole list here for you that you can see on the screen. Spending the time, even if it takes a year or more, uh, of going through all four seasons before taking out a roll of um, old newspaper, newsprint and, and a a pencil and starting to sketch out the elements that are uh, functioning on your property. Where is the water flowing? Where are the good soils? Where is the wind coming from? Where does the sun rise? Things that we take for granted, but we don't always get down on paper. Okay, so I'm going to move off of the philosophy of permaculture because I think I'm running out of time and I'm going to talk quickly about edible forest gardens. So in the permaculture design system we do have these techniques which I mentioned a few minutes ago. One of the other techniques is an edible forest garden and this ties very closely into the idea of silver pasture. In the slide that we're seeing now we're looking at a natural forest and an edible forest garden is um, expected to mimic a natural forest with its multiple layers, the tree canopy, the shrub layer, herbaceous layer, ground cover, roots and vines. And we call this plant stacking or forest gardening. And in the slide that we're looking at now, you can see that rather than forest trees, the, the canopy trees are actually large fruit and nut trees, and they may be pruned. Um, 
as they are on, in many commercial orchards, to open them up and that creates light underneath the trees where you can have um, other perennial plants such as um, smaller dwarf fruit trees, shrubs such as various currants, gooseberries, any kind of berry, herbaceous plants like comfries, rhubarb, herbs, then the root vegetables in the rhizosphere, uh, ground cover plants such as strawberries and um, other plants that don't grow tall, but we can also have a vertical layer of climbers and vines. And in this way, we're stacking the plants and we're also developing plant guilds. So in this particular slide, I'm showing underneath fruit trees um, an example of some perennial plants. This one is a perennial onion. Um, a Welsh onion. The next slide is showing also under fruit trees um, gooseberry and black currant bushes. And there's lots of comfrey and other herbs like lovage, which is a per, uh, perennial um, pollinator and beneficial um, insect habitat. So in this way, we're developing habitat and we are providing for the whole ecological system. Now, I'm going to finish now and let the livestock people and the agroforestry people talk a little bit more about these topics. I just wanted to introduce the breadth of permaculture, which as you can see is a very big subject. And that's it for me. I'll be here for questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We'll be right back after this uh, short break with our next presentation. <laughs>
All right, hello again. So we're back, and we will now have Shamu uh, present for us. All right, Great. take it away. Uh, hello, New Milford. Uh, happy to be here. Excited to hear about this farm and all the educational work. We I also come from an educational farm, just up the watershed called Adama. Adama is a biblical Hebrew word for earth, as in Adam and Eve were made from the Adama. And we're all about cultivating the soul and the soil, finding that the integration between farming, sustainability, regenerative agriculture, and what we learn from being part of a natural ecosystem and working together as a community. And I'll talk about silver pasturing, but I'm going to do a quick introduction to our farm. We are blessed to cultivate and steward land that was traditionally Mohican land um, up the river from here. That's our... And just to say we're part of a larger organization, we're part of the Isabella Friedman Jewish Retreat Center and a Jewish environmental organization called Chazon. Uh, we're basically changing the nature of what it means to be Jewish so that sustainability is a central part of it. We are regenerating culture and agriculture. This is a photo from our uh, first fruits parade, um, which comes from a holiday called Shavuot, or uh, Christians might know it as Weeks. Um, and that's happened in the spring and where we, you, you can see goats in the side of this slide and uh, some of the first fruits from, from the farm. And so how do we bring, this is a, a ritual that our ancestors did several thousand years ago when we were in the Middle East and we're bringing these rituals back in a new way imbued with, with regenerative agriculture and community stuff. So that's, that's what we're doing. And that also means we're, uh, we're, we grow vegetables. We have a CSA. We donate a lot of our food. We have a food access program to make sure that f folks who can't afford organic, organic food, vegetables, also enjoy our vegetables as well as our CSA members. We have a sliding scale CSA. And so uh, that's some of the context of the larger farm. On the left side, you see some of our luscious cover crop, um, vetch and, and rye building the soil. And you see us using something called a broad fork. We're moving in the direction of, of, or many of our beds have been transitioned into reduced tillage or no tillage at all as a way of, of conserving soil carbon and soil health in general. Now these are just some of the, the basics of what it means to be, uh, this is called the cool farm, but basically regenerative or climate smart agriculture. So I'm talking in this case specifically about integrating livestock. Silva pasture is the deliberate integration of trees and grazing livestock operations on the same land. It is part of the larger uh, concept or frame of agroforestry, food from trees. So rather than imagining ourselves clearing land, as many folks, farmers did here in the last 300 years, and certainly the land that we currently farm on was was cleared two to 300 years ago. You know, no trees, grass being the basis of animal agriculture. We're thinking about ways in which we can integrate trees back into animal agriculture for all the great reasons, all the great things that trees do, stabilizing the soil, drawing carbon down from the atmosphere and storing it, providing some shade. Think about a summer like this where it was hot and dry. We have a lot of cool season grasses who did very well under the shade of some trees. We're not talking about under a full forest canopy. But we're talking about some amount of shade that, that increases production basically and helps out, uh, especially during times of drought. Benefits of silva pasturing, grass and and leaves from trees, right? So you can have more productive land. You can produce meat, and at the same time, you can produce wood, whether that's firewood or uh, saw, saw lumber or fruit or nuts from your trees. For us, it definitely reduces the mowing and the weed whacking that we need to do in our orchards. Many, much of our current 
four acres or so that are in chestnuts uh, is very brushy. And I'm sure people who farm here are familiar with Asian bittersweet and multiflora rose and the challenges of dealing with some really uh, aggressive plants. Goats and sheep are really helpful. Uh, reduces the competition for those trees, especially in the early years. We're still in the establishment years. The chestnut trees are just a couple of years old. So reducing the competition from those grasses and vines, especially in the zone right around the trees, very important. Shade for sure means less heat stress for animals. Uh, you diversify the forage for the herd, meaning that they get to eat other things uh, besides grass. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those trees that you can use as forage trees. And there's nutrient cycling, right? The trees are getting fertilized, lightly fertilized, right? By the manure and trees in general is what we want, right? In the world, uh, trees are great habitat. This zone we live in, right? That you can call this uh, Maple Nation as, as some folks do. Our, our region here is a tree-based region, right? So if you want to deal with pest problems, as Cynthia was talking about in a more integrated way, permaculture talks about, it's great to have some trees with branches that your flycatchers can perch on while they're going out and, and eating uh, insects that are bothering your crops or your livestock, right? And of course, soil building and climate resilience. So grass plus trees is better than grass alone. That's the idea. These are just some, some different ways of understanding what's happening in a silva pasture system. And I should say we're really early in the experimentation with this. We've just established our chestnut orchard, but we have been doing various forms of silva pasturing for a while, this, especially in the edge areas that are really you know, silva pasture or brush pasturing, but using uh, goats and sheep in, in the very brushy areas. These are just different examples of how uh, different ways of structuring rows of trees as alleys with large grass areas in between as one way of doing it. And thinking about spacing in terms of your fencing, we're using mobile fencing, right? How, how big do you want your paddocks to be? How often are you moving the animals? Do you want to be able to get in there with a the mower afterwards, right? It's just a little bit about chestnuts and why we chose chestnuts. They're a very tasty, versatile food. They were a big part of the American diet, you know, 100 plus years ago before the um, American chestnut was largely knocked out by the, by the blight. They build and hold carbon. They're low maintenance. We grow vegetables. Vegetables are very high maintenance. Um, and you're trying to grow apples or blueberries, also much higher maintenance. And the timing for the labor for us really works with chestnuts because we're really busy May through August this time of year. Yeah, you know, through mid-September, we're really busy. But this time of year, the veggies are slowing down. A lot of our fields are going into cover crop. And this is when harvest season happens for chestnuts. Now we actually have some hands available by late September, early October. It was also appropriate for the land, uh, slope land with minimal infrastructure. Veggies take infrastructure, meaning deep well. I wouldn't grow veggies without deer protection, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, and we raise goats and sheep for meat, and we also make parchment, which is uh, that we use to write uh, sacred ancient texts on uh, in the Jewish tradition. So if you're familiar with a mezuzah on someone's doorpost or when the Jews break out the Torah, it's not a book made of paper. It is a scroll of animal skin. So that is another thing that we're producing on our farm. Oops. There we go. And this is what the chestnuts looked like when they went in. <laughs> this was peak COVID. This is spring of 2020. Uh, and, um, and we're putting in dormant Asian and Asian American hybrid chestnuts on the land. Had some big volunteer days, which were, which were super fun. Cynthia was there. Um, we spent a lot of money on tree protection. Uh, we had a grant from Berkshire Ag 
uh, from Berkshire Ag Ventures, which was very helpful because we could spend a little extra money on tree protection. We don't have a deer fence there and the deer pressure is considerable. So those tubes and the stakes you see inside each of those is a chestnut tree. Right. These are just a few other pictures. Early spring, you can see the uh, you can see the flowers on the big on the big sugar maple trees. Details of our chestnut planting, seven different varieties. Uh, we got design help from Regenerative Design Group. The trees are planted at 2020 spacing, thinking that we'll eventually get to a 40 and 40 spacing once they're to mature, meaning some of the trees will die, some of them will prune out. And when we planted, we added a mycorrhizal inoculant, which helps the trees develop relationships with beneficial fungi. We used cardboard mulch, wood chip, stake, tree tube. We, the maintenance has really been a tiny bit of emergency watering, as you can imagine this summer, needed some emergency watering, um, pruning them and weed whacking around the tree tube. A lot less weed whacking thanks to the animals. <laughs> and this is uh, very proud of this. This is my the first tree that re ro reached six feet. And you saw how big this tree was when we planted it. It was maybe two feet, year old sapling. And, um, and so they're, they're getting big, which is great. We do intensive rotational grazing, which means we move right now, it's just a herd of 10. We'll probably increase animal number of animals next year. We're moving them twice a week, June through early November. We do a educational ritual kosher slaughter of the goats and sheep in early November. We use a solar charged electric fence and we do bring them brush. When we're cutting brush around the farm, controlling our fence lines, we'll often throw the stuff in a truck and bring them some of that extra brush. We do mow as needed to diversify the pasture. I am often trying to suppress poison parsnip and goldenrod from just dominating the entire pasture and also to reset the pasture pasture when the grasses or the plants are just over mature and they're not good um, nutrition at that point for the goats and sheep. So in this photo, uh, you can see inside the fence, that's our last pasture and down where the person is standing with the goats and sheep, that's the next pasture just to get a sense of, of what it looks like after they've been intens intensive rotational, meaning they eat everything down and then we move them. That's good for soils, it's good for plant diversity and animal health. So that's a new pasture that has not been eaten behind this fence and uh, before before they eat it down. So. Just some future silver pasture plans uh, at the edges of our chestnut orchard to supplement, you know, and to provide more production of the land and provide more food for our flocks. We're planting rows of black locust, hybrid poplars, and probably some willows in the wetter area. We really have some saturated soils in some areas, so one way of of increasing productivity there is planting willows, and those willows will be also the shade that I talked about carbon source, but also forage for the goats. They probably need to be two or three years old before we let the animals in there so they don't get to totally devastated. But these are all plants that root sprout. So if you eat them down, they will bounce back as long as you don't eat them down too much. So I uh, got to see this at all in one, all, all for one, one for all. I think I'm getting that right, A-O-O-A -O -O -A farm, um, just a couple weeks ago. And these are rows of their fodder trees that they rotate their sheep around. And it's a mixture of white mulberry and some hybrid poplar and some willows and some black locusts that they, um, and these trees are just three years old and already their sheep are moving through them, getting to eat off those trees. The grasses are benefiting from a little shade and they're doing what Cynthia talked about in terms of stacking, right? Not just having grass, one level of production, but a whole nother vertical, vertical diversity here. And just providing some silver pasturing resources here. Recommend anything that the Savannah Institute is doing. It's really Midwest based, but there are really pioneers in this whole field of agroforestry and silvopasturing. There's a book called Silvopasture by Steve Gabriel. There are a number of great silvopasture Facebook groups. Um, nice to find something really useful for me to do on Facebook with some good information. And of course, there's the extension offices and uh, the work that the counties, various county ag 
extension people are doing. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Up next, we'll have uh, Kelly Babin uh, explain. Explain. Yeah. Hey, (laughs) tell us about your farm. Sure. Um, So I am sitting amongst experts and and, um, am thrilled because really um, I'm clueless. And um, I've had the farm for 12 years. Um, It was a horse property. So I've really spent 12 years instead of a year sort of looking at what I have. hoping I can figure out what it needs um, and um, and really am fortunate to live in an area that has so many resources um, that can help you like Cynthia's come out um, to help me with cover crops or Kip Kalinowskis, um came out through NCRS as a consultant to help me with a really wet area that I have and and offer suggestions um, so I'm working to create a design system. Um, I'm like probably you in the audience, um, just uh, always looking for more information, always looking for um, what will work in our area because yes, there is a lot of great information, um, but when you don't have the background knowledge to be able to implement that, um, I have a black thumb. I don't grow anything. <laughs> um, I raise livestock, um, but my goal is to provide the best for my livestock. So um, I agree with all of you know the core principles of, of permaculture and silvopasture and um, am in still after all of this time of fencing and refencing and how big is the past paddock well that one was too small so you take the fence down and um moving moving goats and sheep and thrilled when i don't have to weed whack um <laughs> really thrilled that when i don't have to weed whack um and it and it's taken all of this time and and it's still a work in progress to create a design system um, that regenerates our land. I, I have what was horse property, so my land just sat there with horses standing on it and they fed hay and um, the soil's compacted and they clear cut everything and um, it's not necessarily the best environment for my animals. Um, so uh, again, I was excited to be here really to speak to the availability of, of experts and help and assistance in the local farms that I, you know, have met or that are around me, um, and the various agencies that um, exist um, that are free, <laughs> most importantly for poor farmer, um, uh, and you know how how the small areas that I've been able to improve uh, that you can you can literally see the difference you can see the difference when the sheep want to be in a certain area or you can see when the cows are using you know the small hedgerow that survived as a natural barn in the winter and um, just how much the animals enjoy the variety of forage um, high low and in between for the goats that love to stand up and and eat my willow trees and um, and, and all of the nutritional benefits that go along with it. So it's, um, I think, an exciting and, and a no-brainer that, that every farm needs to implement some form of permaculture because um, if not, it's, it, your soils are literally just washing away <laughs> and, and you know, going, going fallow. So um, yeah, I don't have a great presentation um, I was just, again, excited to um, hear more about it and um, and sort of speak to the fact that, you know, don't give up hope that, you know, even all these years later, um, that improvements can be made. And it's amazing to see um, how, how the animals appreciate it. That's wonderful. Well, it's really good to still have that perspective. I mean, you've been farming for 12 years, <laughs> and uh, how many acres do you farm? Uh, my farm is only 14 acres. That, hey, that's still quite a bit of land to take care of. And what do you think like is the most challenging thing right now for you? Uh, well, um, the weather. <laughs> right oh. now it's the weather. Uh, this year's sorghum didn't beat the weeds. 
Um, so that all got turned under and I thought it would be the year for permanent pasture in one of my areas, but it's been so dry I can't risk, you know, trying to plant seed that isn't going to grow. So it's another year of cover crop, which is great, but the sheep are eating it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the weather is hard and, and for me it's really, it's the knowledge. I um, didn't get an ag degree. <laughs> I was supposed to be a teacher um, and, and don't, don't have a farming background either. So um, okay. it's been uh, a learning experience. It's been fun and I'm not complaining in the least, but it's um, the, the biggest challenge is not tripping over my own feet. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's, you know, it's, it's just um, trial and error. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. That's wonderful. All right. Well, we'll be back with our final speaker right after this break.
be Rose Drown, and so she can just take that away. Awesome. Hi, thank you so much for hosting us tonight. I'm really excited to be here along with these other wonderful panelists. Thanks so much for sharing your experience and knowledge. So uh, I am from Long Table Farm. We originally incorporated as Upper Pond Farm, but when we acquired a little bit more land and set up our home farm, which is just a tiny little four and a half acre plot of land on Beaver Brook Road in Lyme, we went through kind of a rebranding to focus on the, the new incorporated business identity that also included my husband, Ryan Quinn. And uh, so we chose Long Table Farm because we believe strongly that if you have more than enough, you should build a longer table rather than a higher fence. So it's a message of inclusivity. It's a message of sharing the abundance of your land, which fits very well with a lot of permaculture concepts. Um, our farm was started in 2014 and initially we plowed the land that was mostly perennial grasses with horses. And we did that simply to set up a permanent bed system because we are a low tillage farm. We don't rotor till, we don't plow on an annual basis. We do produce a lot of annual vegetables, which most annual vegetables are from a high tillage environment. But what we know about a high tillage environment is it destroys soil structure, it reduces the active biology in the soil, it makes soils lose organic matter faster. So as a farmer who wants to build soil, I want to reduce tillage. And I don't want to bring any uh, synthetic chemicals into my system. Uh, so that means eliminating the use of herbicide, which a lot of no-till farms in this country are using a lot of herbicide to accomplish that goal. So my farm does not use any synthetic chemicals and we have through building the health of our soil and the health of the surrounding ecosystem, as well as the farm ecosystem itself, we have been able to move away from using any organic chemical. This year, we sprayed nothing but nematodes and dish soap for pest control. Um, we're primarily a vegetable farm and we take our produce to market as well as our CSA. So things have to look beautiful. Uh, so we've, been able to get to that point uh, by cultivating a lot of biodiversity on the farm. And silver pasture is part of having a biodiverse farm, uh, increasing the habitat, integrating the different parts of your farm is very important to having a healthy farm ecosystem. So uh, in 2015, we expanded to our second site which is our home farm now. And then we also farm several land trust properties. We're so happy to work with the Lime Land Trust. They had the only remaining farm in my town go out of business and leave the land fallow for years. And before that, they stopped fertilizing because they couldn't afford fertilizer. So the, the, the fields are depleted and full of invasives. And we've been using our livestock, and that's Sparkle, who's eating a bunch of waste vegetables. Um, she was the first big animal we purchased on the farm. Um, she's a milking shorthorn cow. We hand milk her. She gives us about six gallons of milk a day. And she raises her calf as well, which provides us with meat. Um, a lot of our animal integrations started simply at a homestead scale, uh, beta testing. And then we decided that um, there was enough demand and that it was uh, enough of a complementary fit with our vegetable production system to expand them into the farm scale and integrate them very tightly with our vegetable production. And on four and a half acres, you have to be very tightly integrated in order to produce enough to support our farm family and our crew members which I'm so excited to show you in the next slide. So uh, that's my husband and I, and on the left we have Bree and Riley and our apprentice Audrey. And Bree and Riley are, are kind of a permanent fixture on our farm now, and we host woofers as well as apprentices on occasion. And uh, behind us in this photo is our barn where we 
We really needed to be able to distribute our produce year round. With high tunnels, we're able to produce food for our community year round, fresh food. Uh, so the barn that we put up with some help from the Connecticut Department of Agriculture through grants is instrumental in being able to provide year round food to our community, which is at the top of our holistic goal. Um, our farm integrates holistic management, permaculture concepts, agroecology. I've studied a lot of different systems of agriculture, and my advice to any farmer would be to pick and choose and figure out works for you and your land, and uh, keep tabs, see what's working, what's not working, and change it up. Trial and error. So this is our farm stand. That's one of our woofers that escaped Brooklyn for a couple of months. And, and helped us set up the stand on that day at the Chester Sunday Market, which is a great place to visit. Beer and pizza and local vegetables. How can you go wrong? These are our CSA baskets. We're feeding about 140 CSA families, plus the two farmers markets, plus a, a slew of wholesale accounts. Um, we're also providing for a wedding this weekend in Litchfield County. Uh, yeah, and so these animals are here because animal integrations are for the whole farm, not just for the livestock. So when I'm mowing down a cover crop or a pasture that's been munched on, I am thinking about the turtles that are living in the understory, and I'm, I'm putting my flow mower up high so I don't kill any of them. We have a lot of animals that call our farm home other than our livestock that's a, st a stick insect and an eastern box turtle those eastern box turtles live in one tiny little space for their entire life so uh, if he's there now he's going to continue being there unless i hurt him uh, so you know we're considering all of the animals on the farm not just our livestock uh, and they are helping us um, by providing ecosystem services in the form of pest control and, and so many other almost immeasurable benefits. We like to pause and have nature moments. So all of these pictures are, are real animals that people on the farm have enjoyed picking up. Um, we provide a lot of habitat uh, to butterflies, salamanders, and sometimes even more intentionally with things like bat boxes and even just little parts of the farm left wild. I have a slide here of really carefully tended vegetables with a very unkept walkway next to them and that is a habitat for so many things that are going to help me produce a plant that looks beautiful by providing habitat to a predator just like a bird and a tree um, even with perennial grasses uh, there there's a strong benefit so letting the farm be a little bit wild is is a really good thing for trying to produce food without any chemical inputs so we established a really healthy vegetable CSA, and uh, I came from a livestock background, had worked on diversified farms, and started a vegetable CSA because of the simplicity of just growing vegetables and just the lack of controversy with vegetables. No one's offended by vegetables, <laughs> but we like animals. and. I think that a small amount of animal protein in a diet can be a, a climate smart future for regenerative agriculture and our whole food system. Um, animals such as cows get a lot of flack for producing greenhouse gases. And if we are growing them sustainably with perennial grasses and trees, we can actually sequester more carbon than what they're releasing. There's a great book that's referenced at the end of my slide uh, show. It's called Cows Save the Planet, and I believe they can. So we wanted to diversify our product offerings so that we can basically feed our community year-round their entire diet. That's our end goal. And we also wanted to solve some vegetable press problems after a few years of cultivating in our greenhouses, our high tunnels. We started to see a little incursion of white fly and things like that. And we didn't want to use a chemical way to get rid of it. Uh, so we started growing chickens in there and it completely solved the problem and led to reduced tillage, 
by us not having to remove the vegetation. The chickens were doing it for us. The chickens started tilling the soil a little bit for us. So my integration is a little different because they're tightly integrated with an animal vegetable production system. Um, so there are unique challenges and benefits. So uh, a lot of nutrient cycling is a benefit. Uh, we're not buying fertilizer anymore. We're creating our own compost uh, and we are weaned off purchasing fertilizer from off farm and uh, we're, we're closing the loop. And the production of the crops in those tunnels that have had livestock in them is a testament that we don't need to fertilize them anymore. Uh, so, you know, if I was starting over again, I would once again just kind of slowly integrate and see how I like it. I like taking care of animals. So a lot of these suggestions are really based on people's personal preferences as a farmer, how you like to say spend your time. Things I would recommend you watch out for are follow those food safety rules for raw manure really closely. It's 90 days from a crop um, that is harvested off a vine like a tomato that's not touching the ground and it's 120 days from a raw manure application for a crop that's on the ground. We take food safety really seriously on our farm and, and in integrating animals and vegetable production is dangerous if you're not being careful. You can you can make people sick. So food safety is at the center of our concern when it comes to livestock. We're changing clothes and shoes between doing livestock chores and vegetable harvest. And um, another thing we watch out for is soil compaction. And the livestock that we currently have, we're moving them adequately so they're not causing any compaction and we use certain animals on certain soils. Um, so plus, not everybody wants to chase cows or pigs or round up chickens is another consideration. So these are our Freedom Ranger meat birds. They turn a tunnel in about two months from full of vegetation to ready for planting of the next crop with, with no tillage whatsoever on our part. They, they're doing everything for us. We might do a little raking of what they didn't like to eat. And then, you know, they're turning that into very healthy yellow fats, uh, which make for a better quality bird. And it's, it's a really nice fit for us. Our pigs also help us with waste diversion. Our pigs are, um, in the forest in the fall in the winter in the spring and in the summer they turn our compost for us under trees as well we raise our own berkshires uh, and they have babies on the farm and that middle picture is the maternity sh shoot with our sow munchie uh, and yeah that was uh, one of our first reasons for getting pigs was just to get rid of damaged sweet potatoes and winter squash in a way other than the compost pile and turn them into a high quality protein source. The most exciting animal integration for me on our farm is our cows. This slide demonstrates what they can do in a day. Uh, so it was a morning and night uh, of a rye cover crop. Ruminants are incredible. Cows are ruminants. They have a four chambered stomach and they can churn cellulose, which is the, what protects the cells of grass into high quality protein because of the rumen environment, because of a particular enzyme called ligonase that can chop right through that and expose the juicy innards of the cell. Uh, so I feel like cows have a place in our food system and they can, they can turn grass into milk and meat, which is, is really valuable for humans. Maybe we shouldn't be growing all this grain as a planet for cows. We certainly shouldn't be tearing down forests for supporting cows. We should probably be eating a little bit less meat and milk as a society for our food system. But I, I do not advocate for the complete eradication of cows uh, because they are so synergistic with certain pieces of land and they can make something for us from that land. And by grazing perennial grasses using management intensive rotational grazing, they can actually increase the carbon sequestration in the root zones. They're taking a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and putting it back in the soil where we all agree it belongs. So I forced the cows to eat this down really hard. I was mean. 
and this is what they left me, a terminated cover crop. As a low-till farmer, a terminated cover crop is a tricky thing, especially with rye. It wants to live. So that's one way that I'm really excited to use my cows. We are beta testing turkeys right now. Uh, so this is our first 40 turkey batch. It was really born out of necessity that I just could not find a, a locally sourced high welfare turkey for my own Thanksgiving plate. Uh, so they are taking out the tomatoes from this tunnel right now. They're pretty close to done with the tunnel and they've done uh, their due diligence in just two weeks. They've turned it from this luscious green palace to this brown sad place <laughs> that they now want to leave <laughs> and go and eat grass and they have been doing that they're probably doing that right now so uh yeah those uh, that's what they yeah this is what they were doing yesterday i did get this slide in here they they're very happy to go out and graze and prevent me from having to mow and weed whack yeah so these are our ducks. That's the, the last thing that we have integrated. Our ducks are integrated into our orchard. We have hardy kiwi above them, and they are grazing underneath it to help with pest control. And uh, they produce delicious eggs for us. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for uh, coming out to speak. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for watching. And uh, you will see that we have one more workshop uh, scheduled sometime next week. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good. Perfect. Good. Thank you guys so much. Where do you